To support Jared Graves, visit his official GoFundMe page at www.gofundme.com slash strength dash four dash Jared. Jared, we love you. Thank you so much for trusting us with this interview. And Damien, thanks for all you did to get this done. Go get them, Grubby. Welcome, Mountain Bikers. Thanks for tuning in to Vital MTB's The Inside Line podcast. This is your host, Damien Breach. This episode is a very special one, as we sit down with Jared Graves at his home in Toowoomba, Queensland, just a week or so after surgery to remove a tumour in his brain. We chat about that surgery, discovering the tumour, his prognosis, his plans for the future, but we also find out a little bit more about what makes Jared tick and what makes him the champion he is. This one was emotional for me and Jared, and I was more than honoured to be able to have this opportunity to help Jared share his story. Grab a box of tissues and uh, enjoy the show. This Vital MTB Inside Line podcast is brought to you by Jensen USA. Shop for great deals and get professional advice on your favorite mountain bikes, components, and riding gear. Over 2 million happy cyclists served since 1994. Visit JensenUSA.com slash the Inside Line podcast and use code Inside Line for 10% off qualifying items. Maxxis Tires. Where the rubber meets the dirt, Maxxis makes no compromise tires for any rider, any trail, any time. We go to bed and put the TV on and if it's not like just, just some like real basic comedy, I just can't even follow it. It's like kind of, you just absolutely cooked at night. I'm sorry, Spoma, this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> <The> <laughs> um, yeah, so... Basically what I emailed you forward is pretty much what I'm going to ask. Yep. But we take whatever tangent we need, whatever direction we need, it doesn't really matter. Yep. Um, it's whatever you're comfortable with. Um, um, as I said, it's new for me, so yep. we'll see where it all goes from there. Um, is your phone off? Or just silent at least? I think it's on silent, but I'll just put it on airplane mode anyway. I've been to do that for a while now. <coughs> so yeah, as I was saying before, I was expecting the house to be a nightmare of a mess, <laughs> but it's not at all. No, things have uh, I've gotten a bit tidier over the years, especially things like that the little uh, robot vacuum cleaner that has dead set the best thing we've ever bought. Yeah, especially with the dog hair, like the dog dog hair just gets everywhere in here. That thing absolutely kills it. <coughs> I'll just do a little quick intro. Um, hi, I'm Damien Breach, and welcome to Vital's Inside Line podcast. Kind of feels like I need to say that with an American accent because I've never <laughs> heard it before with an American accent. But welcome to Vital's Vital MTB's Inside Line podcast, coming to you from the beautiful, sunny Queensland and the home of Jared Graves. Um, from where we're doing this interview now we can see all the way to probably New Zealand <laughs> way up in what's this area called the this is the Darling Downs right here the Darling Downs and we've got Jared who's how long out of hospital are you um out of hospital one week today and how how, how long ago was your surgery uh, surgery was two weeks ago today um, I guess we'll just start with probably the most <clears throat> important thing people want to know is just how are you going yeah every day gets a little bit better so that that's been nice but like we we're just saying before whenever you get someone digging around in your brain it's sort of can take a little bit a little bit of time to come good um i think i'm kind of struggling with a bit at the moment is just some of the meds i'm on is just um makes me feel pretty weak and and uh and that sort of stuff and i kind of get pretty mentally fatigued pretty easily and uh just uh thought process is a bit slow and Still got some numbness in the side of my face, so I'm sort of spitting a bit and drooling and doing all that fun stuff. And I lose a bit of food out of my mouth, so <laughs> nothing's really changed there, though. So, um, no, we're getting there. Still have to drink through a straw for the most part, which is like pretty good. Went to went to some friends for dinner the other night, and I was drinking red wine out of a straw, so kept it real classy there. Um, it just falls straight back out the left side, so gets a bit weird. Can but, you drink um, beer out of a straw? Or does it just get too frothy? I don't know. I haven't tried. I haven't had a beer since. Like, 
I've only had a bit of had a couple of glasses of red. That's been about it. And so probably shouldn't go too too deep on the alcohol at the moment. <laughs> but it is nice to relax and have a bit of a social outing. So that was nice the other night. Um, well, this this is wind back the clock a little bit. So what what actually what's happened to you and and how did you find out about it all? Um, so. As it turns out, I had my first seizure in Whistler. Um, I was by myself at the time, like the rest of the team hadn't come yet. And uh, because you're sort of almost like, like you kind of pass out during them. So I sort of woke up and just thought I had like a really vivid dream almost. So I kind of um, just wrote it off a little bit. I didn't even, wasn't even 100% sure it had actually happened. But then <clears throat> two days after getting home from Whistler, I was right on this very couch and... Uh, my second seizure was like right where I am right now, so, and Jess was right here with me, so obviously when, when she saw the whole thing, it became a lot more sort of real then. And then uh, at the time though as well, didn't go to the hospital straight away, and we kind of put it down to uh, maybe jet lag and fatigue and all that, cause it was a long, long trip home, hadn't really slept for a couple of days with the jet lag, and, and uh, but then it was about another week later and I had like a, a really bad one in bed at about four o'clock in the morning. And uh, that's when I sort of woke up from that one, getting boarded off with paramedics, taking me up the stairs here. So, and at, at the time then, like, someone would ask me a question, I couldn't even, couldn't tell them what day it was and all that sort of stuff, so it was pretty scary. Um, and then, obviously, have seizures, so first thing is um, seizures are basically just, like, excess electrical sort of activity in the brain, so first thing was to get scans done and and uh that's when they found the tumor pushing against the part of my brain that controls the left side of your body because it kind of made sense then because every every seizure i had sort of um it really just felt like the left side of my face was just like locking up and twitching <clears throat> the scariest thing is that the seizures what i do remember of them it actually feels like my eyeball is coming out of my head which was like pretty freaky but <laughs> definitely an interesting sensation but um so yeah, we went to hospital and straight away they just uh basically here in Toowoomba they don't have you know neurosurgeons or anything like that so straight away they referred me to uh to Dr. David Walker down in uh in Brisbane at Brisbane and Spine and uh we sort of got a whole series of scans and, and everything done and worked out exactly what we were dealing with and decided that uh, while it, it has been found since that it was extremely slow growing, which is good news, um, it was a grade two tumour, so uh, they thought the best plan of attack would be to get in there and get it out anyway, just because what people don't sort of know about, what I didn't know about tumours especially was tumours aren't just like what you'd think, they're not like just a, a solid thing growing there, they're actually like in, in the head, it actually grows in amongst healthy brain tissue, which uh, so if you don't sort of get it taken care of, it can get pretty messy, so... Um, got in there and like I say to you as well like where it was is right next to the part of the brain that controls the left side of the body so that's why I've got sort of the numbness in the left of my, my face because it's still like swelling on the brain that can take maybe a month or could be even longer for that to settle down so um it's pretty pretty nasty stuff really but uh do you yeah. remember do you remember the moment when obviously they've done lots of testing and so forth and the doctor comes into the room or someone comes in the room and tells you that news. Do you remember it? Yeah, I was, we got that test, that scan done here. Actually, one of the hospitals in town here. So, um, I, don't, I don't, I think I was kind of just feeling, I was still a little, little, little sort of bit out of it at the moment because my brother's actually got epilepsy as well. So at first we just thought it was, it was epilepsy and they come in and they tell you that, but at the same time, like, it, it kind of didn't really hit home straight away because uh, you don't know exactly what you're dealing with. Like sometimes you have, you can have tumours on and that sort of stuff that that are you know doesn't really affect you at all. And it it could have just been a they didn't really tell me or didn't have any real answers for me. So I guess it it took until actually being down in Brisbane for it to actually and hear from the the neurosurgeon team down there. And uh, then it sort of all sunk in a bit and things got a bit bit emotional a few times but um it's uh not something you really expect to hear and it's been like like I said as well been a bit life-changing the last sort of month um for obvious reasons and uh 
but I think there's already sort of positives coming out of it, like the way I'll approach certain things for the rest of my life now will be pretty different. You know, trivial things don't seem important anymore and that sort of stuff. So, and uh, it's good to just sort of be able to sort of sit back and really gets your priorities straight. So things, you know, like I said, some things that I thought were important just really aren't a big deal anymore. So positives to be taken. So just, but just got to... Uh, kick its ass basically that's about it so the you know focus now obviously being health and and my treatment and recovery and all that sort of stuff so so like we i guess we just started talking about that a bit before and basically i've got six weeks of radiation treatment or i'll be in brisbane for that so so yeah you have to move down to brisbane full time just just for six weeks yeah yep. and actually start me on low dose chemo at the same time they say the radiation and the chemo works really well together so but from from what I've been told, like the chemo I'm going to be on is um quite well tolerated by the body, so it's not like one of these ones that just leaves you doubled over a toilet bowl, vomiting that sort of stuff. At least from what they've told me, so sounds a bit bit better. But I'm expecting to feel pretty shitty for you know that's that's six months where you do it's one week on, three weeks off for six months. So yeah, but I could be home for that at least, so that'll be that'll be nice. So obviously, I mean, I mean, what's been hap- happening since I guess you found out? I mean, we we as the the community on the outside, we, we found out via social media or whatever it might be, and and the catalyst for this podcast was really Matt Thompson um, from Colorado, just saying, you yeah, know, we've got to hear from Jared, we've got to hear, you know, what's going on, and but yeah, we we can't contemplate what's been happening ever since you know you found out and you started sharing the news. Yeah, I guess it's been like, you have your good days and your bad days, like, I definitely had a few little mini meltdowns along the way, sort of early on, and things have been better since surgery now that you're sort of in it and you're, you know, doing steps to attack it and whatever, like, that actually, it's sort of almost like training a little bit, you know, like, once you're in it and doing it, then things sort of get a bit easier, so I'm just glad that the surgery's done and we're sort of at the stage now where you can, uh, you know, really get after it and... It's not this, uh, like, I, I've struggled at first just knowing that I'd go to bed at night and you know you've got, like, a tumour in your head and it's still just sitting there, you know, so that kind of would just get on my nerves a bit sometimes and now that it's out, and I think they're pretty confident they got, like, all of it, but you still have to go through the treatment just in case anything microscopic is left behind and that sort of stuff because then it could grow back and, I mean, there's never there's never a guarantee that it won't grow back anyway, but these days like medicine and technology and all that's pretty amazing so they've given me a you know pretty much best 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 case sort of prognosis i guess which is nice they said it was very very slow growing um just a little bit shitty with where it was on the brain how it's just affecting sort of my fine motor skills especially my left hand and like i I don't can't really hear myself my voice at the moment but to me, my voice feels like very weak and, and all the meds I'm on just sort of makes me sort of shaky and quivery and a bit irritable all the time. So that's kind of, that's been the main shitty thing at the moment. What do you I remember when we were uh, messaging each other, you kind of were talking about, I guess the, um, you, you said people from high school you hadn't even talked to, got in to- contact with you. So yeah. how was that like that? I guess that wave of whatever that came back to you, what did that feel like? Oh man, I, I can't express enough like how good the support's been. It just makes you, even when you're you know, feeling shitty, you just think about the people that have been reaching out to you and stuff and it just makes you feel a lot better. So um, that's been unreal. That Just the support's been pretty overwhelming and can't say thanks enough to all those people. So Does yeah, it... like I said, like guys from school and stuff, people I haven't talked to for 10 years or 15 years have gotten back in touch and that's been pretty cool too. <clears throat> Does it change the the concept? I guess prior to this, you have Instagram followers, you have you know people you you don't know, and then you, you've got you know double quote fans that you might have signed autographs at a at a bike race. But when when this kind of happens, did it change the way you think about? I guess your your fans and your followers did. Yeah, I, I guess like, I guess like just some of the messages and stuff. Like you realise that do have like an impact on people and how they you know then approach their lives and that sort of stuff so it just makes you want to be like a good sort of role model for them and you know 
gives me all their support gives me the motivation to really do the right things to recover well and hopefully get back on the bike pretty soon and definitely still got you know plans with racing and whatever so but obviously this has got to come first and I think next year is going to be not happening with the racing maybe potentially by the very end of the year but I mean I'm, I'm going to be on chemo until sort of May June anyway so that's the whole first part of the season is is definitely a no-go so that's kind of I guess that's something I was mentally struggling with a little bit early on you know racing bikes is it's all I've done it's all I know so I can't even ride a bike right now and that sort of definitely makes things kind of tough I'd just love to go for a ride right now and you know when I'm past all this then that's something I'll, I'll never take for granted again either just being able to get out and you know but going going out just walking in the morning just getting outside and fresh air is just amazing when you you know the first day when I got out of hospital and we got back went to the grocery store <coughs> and um couldn't get the dumbass grin off my face because I was just so happy that I was out of hospital so even those little things you know just being able to get out and walk around is just just amazing really let's wind the clock back we're going to come back to this this subject later on but for those out there who don't know Jared, like who is Jared? What you mentioned, you, all you've done is ride bikes, but who is Jared Graves? Oh, Jared doesn't know who Jared is. Jared's still trying to figure that out. I think everyone is always trying to figure that out. But uh, definitely someone who I don't know. I mean, bikes has been my life since I was starting with BMX when I was four, sort of thing. So it's, it was a family sport, and uh, just the fact that my whole life basically has been based around sports and not not always necessarily bikes but I was definitely heavily into water skiing for a lot of years when we were young too so that was sort of the other family sport and just sport in general so just when that's kind of taken away and you can't really be that active is it's pretty tough but uh what, what motivates you I mean you 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 talked about BMX and you obviously you're a four, four cross world champ and you, you went to the Olympics for BMX but you used to race downhill back in the days and you transitioned to enduro like what motivates you to do those things what, what what's inside you um I think I've always had a bit of a thing of just sort of when I decide I want to do something I kind of go all in at it like there's no half-assing anything and just the whole process of uh ticking all the boxes so to speak and just making every little incremental gain that you can is just something it's just, just the process has been something I've been really addicted to over the years and when you can see like the improvement when you can measure an improvement in training and or technique or whatever and when you know you know your fitness is on the rise and and everything's starting to click then that's such an addictive process and it's kind of what you know starting with obviously having that BMX background as a kid was a was a great start but then, you know, when full cross sort of came along and I started getting more and more serious about that, probably, you know, 2003, 2004, 2005, that sort of time. And I think it was 2004 when I started racing BMX again, but that was purely just for cross training to help full cross. And, you know, I started doing pretty well and people were like, oh, you know, you, you could go to the Olympics for that. And even then I was just sort of like, nah, you know, like I'm just doing it for training. And But one thing led to another and just sort of escalated and got a bit out of control with it. And uh, sure enough, next thing you're at the Olympics and... So that was something that was pretty awesome. Like I never, never sort of thought I'd end up at the Olympics, especially because you know doing downhill and everything like not an Olympic discipline. Mountain biking is, but only cross country. So you know, and that was such a unique experience that um, nothing has ever been you know anything like that. It was it was uh, pretty mind blowing at the time, and just uh, seeing the scale of everything, and and uh, so yeah, it's something that. I'll always have really good memories with so so you, you you're driven by the challenge like I just love doing like different stuff like I think you know and again with enduro like it came along at the perfect time like 2012 I went back and did all the downhill world cups when I'd kind of had you know four cross was kind of on life support there for a couple of years and and uh I'd sort of I'd won everything there is to win and I was honestly pretty bored with it so especially when the UCI weren't listening and you know, doing things with the tracks to make them sort of bigger and like more exciting and make for better racing and whatnot. And they never really listened to the riders and never tried anything too drastic. Like, 
you'd get like a, a jump on a track that was like maybe a 30 foot double and they'd think it's too big or something and they'd want to like make it smaller or whatever and it's like nah on a, on a mountain bike you can you know you just see what the slope style guys do like the things we were capable of doing was just like so much above what they were giving us to race and it was you know the, the sport was never going to sort of take off and then but then 2012 went back to downhill and for whatever reason like I just I could not get fully my head in the game that year just like couldn't get motivated and I was riding I felt like I was riding well but just um just if you don't have that absolute drive to really push yourself and you know every race run just felt like another practice run and and then I uh, started doing some enduros in 2012 just to mix it up and just I just loved it you know because you're out on your bike you're riding different trails all the time and you can ride with people more. You just get to spend so much time on your bike, and the places it was taking us to were pretty, pretty awesome. And when they announced the whole Enduro World Series, like I just knew that's what I wanted to be doing. And and then sort of getting again the whole training thing, just like trying to get fit and strong. And because you know, four cross was all about strength and power and whatever, and, and your skills too, I guess. But uh just going through that whole process of you know getting back on the road bike again and racing some cross country to to build the fitness and that was just something I got super addicted to as well and can honestly say I just I absolutely love cross country racing now like so you, yeah you've on that point you've changed your body quite a few times throughout <laughs> the career like definitely yeah <laughs> what, what, what's that like um I mean I guess, I guess that's like another aspect of it like just discovering all the things about you know one of the most important things is you know your diet and that sort of stuff and just it's amazing what the body can adapt to if you just like force it to adapt you know like just getting on the road bike again and you know I was 90 93 94 kilos in 2011 like 205 210 pounds for American people and then I got back down to you know I've been cross-country race weight for me is somewhere sort of 75 76 kilos so just the whole body transformation is uh it's definitely not fun because like I'm, I'm naturally a bigger guy so i'm kind of almost like starving myself to really get sort of lean for when i have been serious about a cross-country race and that that part of the process isn't isn't that enjoyable but uh i definitely like food so do you think that's part of a process that some other people may not focused on is, is oh totally yeah is yep. adapting their body to their sport like as it's needed i think it's like that's that's one of the biggest things you can do to really sort of you know put the icing on the cake so to speak is like really looking at your diet and just fine tuning you know the you know, it's it's the fuel you give your body that uh you know it's what it's what your body needs to perform so there's a lot of people that i've definitely had times where i get a bit lazy with it you know off season and you, you notice it so much when you ride. So then when you get in that good routine and you see all the little incremental improvements, like like I said before, that's just so addictive. And that's just something I, I just love, so that, my, that whole process. So my ham and cheese toasty you know, and, <laughs> and a pint of milk I had on the way here is not, not going to help me at all? Probably uh, probably not, no. <laughs> but, uh, well, they're called croque monsieurs now like, <laughs> at the BP service station. Oh, jeez. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's, that's another thing with just reading about diets that are good with uh, cancer treatment and that sort of stuff is like something I'm sort of learning all about now. Like, honestly, though, it's not too dissimilar to the diets I've had myself on before with with uh, sort of cross-country training and that sort of deal. So it's nothing that's going to be too much of a stretch, hopefully. But uh, it's definitely interesting and super addictive, like reading about how certain foods and certain diets can affect, you know, essentially starving cancer cells and that sort of stuff. And and just just clean eating and and exactly what sort of preservatives and that sort of crap can do to your body and and that's basically the biggest thing I've got to cut out is any form of sort of anything with with preservatives in it. So preservatives and uh and just processed food is just not good. So um just yeah another I guess another aspect of just learning and evolving is about to start now. So I've kind of already started the good diet thing. So like my it, diet's always been, I guess, pretty good, but uh, just sort of stepping it up another level now, I guess. In some sense of the meaning, does this just feel like, not just, but is this just another challenge for you, you think? Well, I, I guess that's kind of the way I'm, I'm approaching it, I guess. Like, it's the only way I sort of know how to approach it. So, you, But you can definitely, there's definitely things with racing and training and all that over the years that 
I know has put me in good stead for what I've got ahead. So um, that's going to be a big help and just staying mentally sort of strong and that sort of deal. So um, I'm hoping it's all going to you know, help me out anyway. And I really feel like it is. So it's helped me already. So yeah, it's going to be all good. And talking about help, there's, there's been like a couple of times, at least I've noticed in your career, that you seem to have helped others. Sam Willoughby being one of them, Richie Rude, another. How does, what does that mean to you when you, what, you know, why do you do those things and what does it mean to you? Um, like, I guess early on, like Sam, <laughs> I just saw like so much talent, like absolute phenomenal natural talent and... It's fair to say that the like the bike he was riding at the time when I first met him when he was about fifteen was an absolute pile of crap, and he was still absolutely dominating on it. And uh, and I, I could see like when I got to know him, like we just always got along really well, and he was always just like my little brother, you know. So, um, and he'd come and live with me for summers and that sort of stuff, and we'd train together, and and just seeing like he was like a sponge, like everything I could sort of I'd learnt through. You know, he was looking to make that step to professional racing, obviously, and, and he did that and, and uh, did it probably better than anyone else has ever done it in BMX. And, and um, But just when, when someone really wants to learn from you and, you know, they just they really want to take on board what advice you have to give them, like, I just want to help them so much. Like, I can just see them succeed absolutely as much as they can. What do you, what do you get out of it? I just, like, I just always just loved the feeling of just like you know i don't know it just makes you feel good like trying to like share what you've learned with other people to to help them and help them to progress quicker sort of thing so um like kind of sucked at the time like i remember when sam won his first junior world title we were on the gate right after for the elite final and i could barely like i was there like you know i'm three minutes away from world champs final myself and uh I'm just like screaming at him as he goes around the track and just watching him win a world title was like, <clears throat> gets me a bit emotional now. Like I was like, you know, almost crying at the time. So <clears throat> just, just seeing how much work he put in and knowing that I sort of helped him get there was just like, just something super satisfying. And same sort of thing with Richie. Like just, he was from the, the day I met him, he was, <clears throat> he was just like a, a sponge more or less. And he just wanted to learn everything. And again, like, I've never seen someone with so much natural talent. He's just like, to me, he's like the most naturally talented guy I've ever seen on a mountain bike. No question. So so obviously being this far away from him when he, you know, he started winning races, you know, the last two races of the, the Enduro Series for, for Richie, is it, is it hard not being there? I think like the hardest thing was like, especially like those last two, Ainsa and Finale, was like they're probably the two races I was looking forward to the most out of the whole year. So that was kind of the... I wouldn't say it's been hard because I know I have to be at home, but um, definitely like watching. You know, I was up at 1am the other morning, just couldn't stop checking the live timing and, and all that sort of stuff. So just and just seeing him win stage, another stage, another stage, just like, you know, just makes me so happy. Just seeing him back to where he should be right now. So he's... Uh, you know, he's just killing it and the work he puts in and just the way he rides his bike, you know, and just, uh, just love seeing him do good, so. There's obviously lots of emotion and feeling there, like, you know, do, 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 do these relationships find you or do you find them? Like, do, you know, Sam and Richie and whoever else, you, like, do they, you know, do you, do you seek them or how did... I don't know, I think in both cases, it's just like we just, you know, just personality-wise, like Sam was pretty quiet when he was young and Richie, you know, everyone knows Richie's super quiet, but uh, we've just always gotten along really well and, and uh, for whatever reason, you know, whether it is just because, you know, just taking on, I guess, kind of like a bit of a mentor role and that sort of stuff and just trying to help him out and just them wanting to learn and and just having someone you can really sort of train with and and relate to and bounce ideas off of each other and that sort of stuff so we've just always the biggest thing is just we've all just you know those two guys in particular we've just always gotten along really well and just personalities that just clicked straight away and I think probably a big part of that is just through you know the shared like just training and just wanting to be as successful as you can and do all the right things and and like Sam was always one of the 
he was honestly like one of the very few guys in BMX there's a bit of a kind of like almost like a lot of riders are a bit narky towards each other in BMX and there wasn't too many guys I really got you know really close sort of friendships with and Sam was probably the only one of the only guys that I could really feel like I could be myself around and we could sort of talk to each other kind of naturally and not worry about you know I don't know like just you could you could be yourself around each other and I think that's something he liked as well because he was sort of quiet and and uh that sort of stuff and just we always sort of had each other's backs you know same with Richie so you see do you see a bit of yourself in them like a younger version of yourself well definitely yeah like I guess that was my whole thing when I started getting really serious about sort of training probably around 2003 2004 like and just like that mindset that single mind that focus of just the whole going through doing whatever you've got to do to get faster you know like just training and making the sacrifices and that sort of stuff and so that's something that you know we've all like I said before we, we all have that in common and that's like a you know whenever you've got that and someone else has got that automatically you're going to be like sort of almost drawn to each other a little bit and it's gonna you know personalities that just sort of click I guess so and you talk about, yeah, you, you said sacrifice and training and so forth. And traditionally, a, a while ago, Australians weren't known for that sort of thing. <laughs> so were you, were you an outsider at that stage? Like when it came to the, the, the amount of focus and dedication and less time in the pub sort of thing? Or? Yeah, I, I, I sort of, I, I, I never really felt like an outsider, but I know like, especially with BMX, because I guess I approach things a bit differently to some other guys and that sort of stuff and I know a few guys were like a little bit sort of backstabby towards me a little bit early on and just because I was doing well and doing things differently to everyone else and you know people usually kind of can be a bit scared of something different and you know someone bringing something to the sport that's sort of just a way of approaching things that you know is definitely I, I won't shy away from saying that I was a lot more sort of serious and professional about the way I approached everything you know, like I, I still remember my first uh, my first national team training camp in Adelaide, and the very first night we'd been there. Well, the very first night went and got dinner, and then all the guys just wanted to go to the strip club afterwards. And I was just like, hell no, I'm not going to no strip club. You know, I want to get to get to bed because in the morning we're training and that sort of stuff. And and uh, so that was, you know, as soon as you know you wouldn't do those things with with those guys. Like maybe some guys would be like, I want to, you know bond so to speak with with the guys you're there at training camps with but I was just there for I guess I was like pretty kind of like a selfish approach I guess I was there for me and I was there to train and I was there to beat them you know so at the end of the day we were all sort of there for fighting for Olympic spots so if you're not going to do something that the next guy isn't doing like you've got to be prepared to to go the extra step if you really want to give yourself every chance of succeeding so that's just the way I approached that and some guys didn't like it so much and but uh, I wouldn't change anything, no way. And so that that extreme drive, I guess, from those BMX Olympic days to you talked about like now in enduro where you get to like be with people during the race and hang out. Is it? Yep. Is that a completely obviously a different experience? But do you enjoy that experience more? Like, how have you changed in relation like to that? In enduro, people are definitely. Like, there's a lot more of a friendly vibe. And I think it is any time... And that's kind of the problem with BMX with some relationships between people. Like, when you are actually racing head-to-head, things can get pretty heated. But with Enduro, it's like, you know, you're racing yourself, you're racing the clock. Um, so you don't have that head-to-head competition. Like, sure, there's guys you want to beat and whatever, but at the end of the day, it's all on you. There's no sort of... There's no, you know, BMX like, oh, he cut me off. Well, you know, like, he cut me off in that corner or whatever and you hear people moaning and complaining but there's none of that none of that stuff in, in enduro and downhill and all that so I guess that's that's part of it that I really enjoy and especially with enduro you can you know everyone sort of we all sort of climb to the next stage together and everyone chats and you actually build good friendships that way when you're actually you're out there experiencing the same things and just you get to know people really well when you're out there for like six seven hours a day at some of the EWSs and and or, you know we have some really long days out there so you pretty much got to talk to people and 
you know, that's just a pretty enjoyable sort of side part of it, I guess. I mean, that's a different experience because even with, you know, BMX or downhill, whatever it is, normally you do your practice, you go back to your pits. Yep. You don't really get to spend a lot of time with your friends or follow you know, other athletes, but mm. in enduro, you actually spend a lot of time with your competition. Yep. Which is a different experience. I mean, is that... Is that um, is it as you expected or? Um, yeah, pretty much. I think from the the very first EWS ever in Punta Alla was a. Uh, it was actually a really really good race, and everyone just sort of you know, they didn't have any like water stops as such out on the course, and everyone was sort of sharing water with each other, and you know if, if you sort of learn early on that, you know people kind of had to have each other's backs a little bit. I mean, there was a big thing you saw, Martin Mays helping Sam Hill fix his flat after one of the stages in Ainsa. You know, and that's that's honestly a pretty common thing. If you get to the bottom and someone's had a mechanical, everyone kind of rallies around to help them if they can and, you know, help change a flat or whatever, you know, just try to get the bike going again and get to the next stage. And I'm definitely, like, in <clears throat> I broke my shifter on the first stage in finale last year and then Curtis got a flat on the first stage and, He's a big guy and he he knows that he wasn't going to get through the rest of the day on just a tube. So he decided that there were some really good stages for me at that race. I ended up getting getting some stage wins at that race and that sort of deal. And so he gave me his shifter and Richie sort of hung around and helped me fix it. And then we were both like really short on time to get to stage two. And then we kind of just did like a bit of a pace line, just like drafting off each other to help each other make sure we got to the next stage start with plenty of time. So that sort of whole sort of mentality goes a long way and you know just helping each other out and I guess an ex to an extent it is kind of does kind of feel like a karma thing as well like you know be a good person and you know if you help other people and people see that and they're more willing to help you out if you've got a problem too so you can't just go around being a being a dick and expect people to help you out if you if you need a bit of help so you've just got to be a good person I think. I mean that's that's part of the sport that we as the consuming public or you know who's sit on the sidelines and watch we don't get to see those sorts of things we don't get to feel what goes on and like the liaison stages we're focusing on the racing stages but yep. the the liaison seems you know a pretty important time i think it's just just the races too it's good like because you know every you get a bit nervous for every stage and just having that sort of it, it's almost like downtime like generally the uh for the most part at least the liaisons are fairly comfortable like sorry i'm just burping my guts up here <laughs> for the most part we have like a good amount of time to get to the next stage so you don't have to overly hurry or anything like that so you do have a bit of time if you have a mechanical and need to do some bike work at the end of the stage and, and that sort of deal so um but you know, like i said like some of the some of the conversations and just the general banter that goes on pretty pretty comical sometimes especially like guys like you know eddie masters and that have been doing some more races like pretty pretty funny just uh some of the some of the crap that gets talked about actually so it, it makes for a pretty enjoyable day sometimes i mean at the end of the day it's still stressful with the racing but when you can have that sort of almost downtime between the stages and just chat to someone and get to know someone and and build like sort of friendships and that sort of deal like that that's definitely the coolest part about the whole series and honestly i can't think of one guy in the ews that i think is like a dick you know like everyone's pretty cool so that's been super rad i have a question right here in front of me it says <laughs> who do you hate being beat by the most and you said you like everyone so in looking back to your career he comes the dog i think yep tip tap looking back in your career who do you hate's a strong word who do you least enjoy <laughs> being beaten by you know i think i got this I can't remember when I got this question in an interview maybe a year ago or so. Like, what was that? But there's, there's actually, I cannot name one person where I'm just like, oh, I can't stand being beaten by that guy. Um, if, if I had to name someone, it, it might have been Lopes back in the day, but that said at the same time, like, it was just because... He was a guy I really looked up to when I was young and I just really, really wanted to beat him and we sort of had a bit of a weird weird vibe going on with each other where we potentially didn't get along that great. But like now I can talk to him and like we get along really well and sort of that competitive sort of relationship's kind of gone now and, and you know, 
when I think about it more and more, more and more over the years, it's probably more just because we're very similar, the way we approached everything and very competitive people and, and that's kind of where maybe our rivalry came from and he was definitely the guy I liked beating the most and I mean that in sort of the most respectful way, you know, like, because if you beat him, you knew you'd had a good race, so that was, um, he was probably the one guy I really wanted to beat. Okay. This sort of definitely, I thought about a lot when I was training and that, you know, that got me motivated to train hard because you, you had to be on your A game to beat him when he was, when he was at his best sort of thing, so, yeah, probably him. We'll change the question a little bit. Who would you who would you want to be beaten by? I can honestly say that when Richie beats me, it doesn't bother me one bit because I just know how good he is. I know how hard he trains, and so I've always said like he could win every race. If I if I came second at every race and he won every race, I'd be fine with that. So because uh, I don't mind being beaten by Richie at all. Is there anyone else out there that you go? I really hope that they win. Um. There's a, there's definitely a few guys like, but more on, more on the downhill side of things, I guess that guys I want to see do really well because uh, they're just good guys, I think, and um, guys I get along with well, and because I'm not directly competitive with them, you know, not racing World Cup downhill anymore. So guys like you know, seeing Martin Mays do well, Martin's he's he's an, he's an awesome guy, and I like him a lot, and uh, just seeing him do so well at World Champs was just unreal. And Bruni's awesome, um, definitely Brooke McDonald, like I get along with Brooke really well, and. And that sort of thing. Like, I really wanted to see him do well at Worlds, especially after he qualified first as well. So, guys like that are, you know, there's there's definitely guys like that that I, I really want to see do well and succeed. And you know how good they are, and you know they work hard, and and they definitely take, you know, guys like Brooke. Just seeing how aggressive he is and the risks he takes, and he's, you know, I definitely like seeing him do well. So, um, it's it's definitely changed things since I, I'm not, you know, like I said before, like not being directly competitive against them, like not racing World Cup down, it changes your sort of relationships with people a bit. So, um, but, uh, yeah, I guess those guys mostly. And then any of, the, any of the Australians more or less, like you always want to see other Australians do well, so. No, you're fine. Hello, puppy. Hi, you want to breathe into the microphone? Really? Sorry. What's, what's no. wrong with her? She's been doing this sneaky thing. Does that feel normal to you? Like she's got this fluidy sort of thing. Yeah, maybe just take her. Yeah, she's not very well. Do you want us to go to the range? Yeah. I've got my car behind yours, or oh, you take the van. Um, we can, it's all easy, I can well, stop this. Well, it, so do you have it behind the white one? I'm, no, I'm... Or the black one? I'm behind the white one. Oh, that's fine. Oh, okay. She yeah, drives a van everywhere, so... Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I might take her because she's just not well at it. Did you eat something this morning, Jess? I don't think she did. She's like, very slow. She's dribbling like Jared a bit. Yep. I just noticed, like, I don't remember her Yeah, definitely. I'd just take her then. Okay. Don't need a sick dog now. To <laughs> <laughs> Add that to the equation. But yeah, I mean, yeah, sorry. I mean, if you have to go, then. No, no. Just go. Just look after the dog. I can't really be of much help anyway. Like, I'm. <laughs> I feel like I'm like a prisoner in my own home. Like I can't drive a car, can't ride a bike. So and that, I'm pretty like, useless right now, to be honest. <laughs> and that must obviously... Oh, you're back. What's your dog's name again, sorry? Josie. Josie, you're back. So that obviously breathe Josie, heavily sit. into the sit. microphone. <laughs> oh, you're very cute. That will just wait. So that must... Um, that must be difficult to deal with because obviously this, this is probably apart from injuries in the past but those injuries wouldn't have constrained you as much would they yeah exactly I, like like i said before like it's that's something that was kind of a bit of a mental struggle early on when everything you know like until 12 days before surgery before my last seizure i was like you know full training and everything just getting ready for the last two races got back home and you know after whistler and and just, just preparing for the races and then all of a sudden just like click of a finger and like alright you can't do that now because straight away they had me on anti-seizure meds to make sure I didn't get any more seizures and those things just absolutely wiped me out just like made me feel so out of it and just docile my reactions were like terrible and cause it's essentially just slowing down brain function and like all the stuff I'm on now like even if I wanted to go for a ride right now if, if I just like, I couldn't which like that sort of, I guess I've, I've kind of gotten used to it and just accepted it, but uh, 
knowing that I just need to get healthy again, then I can ride as much as I want again. So that that's a positive thing, and that's sort of the way I'm approaching it. But uh, I definitely had that's that was the cause of a couple of my sort of little meltdowns I'd have at home here early on, just like just feeling so useless, basically. Not something I'm used to feeling, that's for sure. Like I've always just been like, if I want to do something, I just do it, and and that sort of thing. So when that's taken away, it's sort of that was pretty hard for sure. <coughs> And how long do you think, like, um, I guess, how long do you think you can keep yourself entertained for? I noticed, or you told me you've been doing lots of jobs around the house and you've been trying to keep yourself occupied, but... Yeah, I think uh, just getting into a rhythm is, is good. Like, you know, every single morning we've gone out for, for a walk, you know, all hiking trails right here and and that that's good. I can get out and do that and I just love going outside and getting stuff done around the house and uh, ever since we moved in like I'm sure you saw that we've got quite a bit of a hill here right on my backyard you know a bit of land here so I've always been meaning to build a trail and, and that sort of stuff just something I can ride literally off my out of my backyard so I want to sort of that's that's on the to-do list for uh you know with whatever energy I've got with uh sort of the chemo and all that like I'm hoping like they said it, it's fairly well tolerated by the body so I'm just hoping it doesn't completely wipe me out and I should be able to even if I can only go down and just dig for like half an hour a day sort of thing like just doing those things and just try I guess trying to use my time well and and you know because as soon as you start doing stuff around the house you just you forget about other things and it, it's such a big help just being able to do whatever you can and and just sort of ties into my personality I guess just like I just I'm not someone who can just sit on the couch and watch tv for hours and hours and hours so I need to be doing something, doing something to move forward sort of thing, so. I'm like, coming back to that, probably uh, when I dislocated my ankle in finale in 2016, and then I had eight weeks on the couch after that, and that was like, that was like just shit. Like, I could not, I couldn't get up, I couldn't walk. I was on crutches for eight weeks, you know, so I was pretty much confined to the couch, and that was like, that sucked. Absolutely sucked, and, and, uh, that's why, like, again, coming back to, like, Sam, too, and everything he's gone through, like, Sam Willoughby, this is. Just, uh, you know, I feel like I'm, uh, I've been dealt a bit of a bit of a rough hand at the moment, but I can't imagine what, what he's going through, you know, still to this day, like, what he's been through is, like, so much gnarlier than, than what I've sort of been through and just seeing his, his mental approach and went and visited him last year for a couple of days and stayed with him in Elise and, uh, I just think he's amazing, you know, like, he's, he's just, like, so strong mentally and and uh, just really moving move, moving forward in a positive way and he's been such a good person to talk to the last sort of, last five, six weeks since this all started happening, so. <clears throat> yeah, just someone who's, like, been in the same sort of situation, like, in just the click of a finger, everything's been sort of taken away from them a bit and and just, like, hearing how he sort of dealt with some things and that sort of thing, just, you know, just has been a big, big support for me, so he's awesome. Is that, I, that's important, I'm, I'm assuming, that you both now had similar experiences. I mean, he's... Yeah, I still wouldn't... Similar in some ways, but like, in, in other ways, I, I wouldn't trade him for a second, you know? Like, I still kind of... I don't... I definitely don't feel lucky at the moment, but it makes me realise that things could be a lot worse, like... Like I was saying, with the tumour itself, they, they found it to be in the bottom one percentile of slow growing. So that's, you know, really good news. And that was pretty much best case scenario. And and just the fact that I was like fully fit at the time going into surgery and everything like has already, I know it's already helped my recovery. And just being at that that position, you know, and just being young. And, and they said the way it's so slow growing too, it could have actually been there for, for a couple of years and didn't even know about it sort of thing. But, like, there was no, no real signs, like, the one thing I feel like, when I think about it now, that there was, like, because essentially they tell you that, like, the neurosurgeon said that uh, just where it is, and one thing, I, my attention span the last probably 18 months has definitely been a bit off, and, you know, a big thing at, with Enduro was, like, watching GoPro and studying, you know, studying your practice runners to try and learn the, the trails a little bit better, and... I just like haven't been able to do that this year. That's been absolutely undeniable. 
So that was like, I just feel like mentally fatigued and the amount of times that I've just like um, completely lost track of where I was on a stage was like now that I, you know, since this has all started happening, like thinking about it, like so many times this, this season especially I'd get on a stage and think I know what's roughly coming up and then just get completely lost with where I am and just just like, uh, you know, think that, you know, oh, there's a, there's a tricky right-hander coming up. This happened in uh, in France at the EWS. There was one section where I was like, oh, there's a, this tight right-hander coming up. And I got to the corner and I, I went right, but the corner actually went left and I just went straight ahead off into the bushes at about 40k an hour. So it's not really a, a great situation to be in when you know you you got to be so dialed on your line and and focused and all that sort of stuff. So definitely some little things like that have, have popped up when I've sort of thought about you know how this could have affected me. And the one thing that was huge was um just in the days after surgery they got me to do grip strength tests with left hand or right hand and and just as my brain's slowly day by day gotten a bit bit better. Um, Basically, the grip strength in my left hand has tripled since two, two or three days after surgery. So it shows like what a strong, you know, brain-body connection there is. That if your brain's not one hundred percent, there's no way you can ride one hundred percent. And obviously, something was up. Yeah. But you, you didn't know it. But you knew something was a little bit like. <laughs> you know, like I said, I guess it's just been like since we know what's going on. Like when I think back on things that have happened in the last twelve, eighteen months, I'm like. Well, there was that and that, like, and that, you know, 2013, 2014, 2015. There's no way I've just done things and made mistakes and that sort of stuff in races that there's no way I would have done two, three years ago when there was potentially like nothing on my brain then. So, um, just uh, there's it's just little, little sort of fine things, I guess, like that you think about it and you're like, like I said, like with the GoPro, like I just haven't had the mental capacity, just feel like mentally exhausted at the end of the day. and we we'll just get totally lost on a stage and not sort of... And I guess the other things too, like, you know, there's so many wet races we've had and my reactions have been, like, there was, there was times in uh, in La Twille this year where, you know, after the rain, some stages were pretty damn slippery and I'd sort of, you know, start twitching out on a, you know, on a slippery section over roots and rocks and whatever and it's like I just couldn't bring my bike back online and I'd just run straight off the track, like, just my head wasn't like really switched on and just to make those really minute second you know adjustments and, and just get yourself back online that sort of deal and I was just running off the track left and right and uh when I think about that sort of stuff like and I, I couldn't understand why I was doing it at the time either like I knew like I just thought I was just riding shitty in races and that sort of stuff and but like it, it happened too many times when I think about it now for it to be like for, for me to think that what was going on in my, in my head like wasn't affecting how I was riding so and pretty much the neurosurgeons like the whole team sort of they told me that straight up they're like yeah you, you'd definitely be like mentally fatigued and you, your brain will be off because it's constantly you know just fighting and that sort of stuff and and uh so I kind of don't feel like I've really had a, a fair go the last couple of years so but then at least I feel like there is a reason for it now which kind of almost made me feel better so that's what sort of gets me motivated to want to get healthy and strong and get back and I'm not sure, you know, you can't really tell exactly what the future is going to bring but it's definitely a, a motivating thing to get fully fit and healthy and 100% on the bike again and hopefully smash out a few more results, you know. So that's yeah. something that's got me motivated. So I mean, we don't see, we don't, we don't see the... We, being the public, don't ever see these sorts of things and... And you go on websites and read the comments about people's performance. Mm. Hopefully you don't read the comments. I try not to, no. Yeah, but, but sometimes you get sucked into it. But we obviously never know what's going on, like, you know, what's causing any sort of, whether it's a medical issue or a, or any so, other sorts of issues. And we just throw judgments ar around. Yeah, like, and I guess, like, the, the way the results have happened, like, justified, you know, when you've won multiple rounds and, and that sort of stuff and being world champion and stuff like people expect a bit more out of you and in some regards like to be expected but kind of frustrating at the same time now knowing what I know now and especially the last sort of five six weeks learning a lot about like I said before the the whole brain body connection it's like 
there's no way I could be 100% on the bike with what was going on. So just uh, knowing that all that was happening. So you... people generally haven't been like, haven't been bad, but like, it was just like, I knew, you know, thinking about it now, there's, you know, something was up and, and pretty good reason for it, I think. But uh, like I said, it just gets me motivated to get back fully fit and healthy and so, so now you have an indicator of what might have been contributing to I guess your 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 latest your your results for this year but during the time obviously you didn't know what was going on so what what were you doing were, was were you digging yourself a, a, a deeper grave or ha, I mean um, how do you, how do you... I think I've always been like pretty pretty mentally strong with that sort of stuff just like get past a race and I'll be the first to admit I'm not the best mud rider. I feel like I'm not bad in the mud. I've definitely had results, good results in the mud before, but I'm sort of, I'm not the best mud rider. And so that, um, I guess that, that has been a frustrating thing. And then when every, it was just wet, 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 you know, the Enduro wet series. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was just getting, you couldn't, you couldn't like predict, like you couldn't, I feel like the amount of, and when the rains happen, like literally like then you'll have dry practice and then it'll just pour rain the night before the race. And then, and then, uh, you couldn't like, I almost feel like you'd have better chances of, of winning the lottery than how many times it was just comical, like how many times it would rain right before the race. And then you, of course you, you, you've ridden in the dry in practice and you just have no concept of, you know, how the track's going to change and what the grip levels are going to be like and that sort of stuff. And it just adds another stressful sort of element to it. And then knowing that my brain wasn't probably firing 100%, just making, like I said, all those little fine adjustments and not being fully switched on, just making things even harder again. So, But I think I've always been pretty mentally good at just sort of, you know, getting past it and just forgetting about it, a bad race and then just knuckling down again, you know, a few days after the race, having a couple rest days, but then knuckling down and just preparing as best I can for the next one. And that's something I've never sort of gone away from, I guess. It's, I'm pretty good at just like putting a, you know, at the end of the day it is, and I've always had the opinion of it is just bike riding, you know, I'm sure it's my job and you're sort of being paid to get results and whatever. And but at the end of the day, and like this just confirms it, you know, like everything that's going on, there's so much more to life than, than riding bikes and and that sort of stuff so even like now just the way that the chemo and all that sort of stuff affects like really want to like you know start a family sometime soon and that sort of stuff and even that's kind of on the on the back burner a bit now you know because you, you can't do that while you're on chemo so it just affects you affects your little swimmers a bit too much i think so um some some people sometimes put them away for future use yep yeah, I've actually, uh, yeah, I got that awesome experience the other day, which is honestly one of the most awkward things I've ever done in my life. I absolutely hated it. So, just explain the process to us. I guess that's that's another really sort of real part about it. Like, went in to see, uh, I'm not sure what what you call the doctor that talks to you about that sort of stuff, but went in for a, a visit. Was it last Monday or last Tuesday? The day I got out of hospital anyway, went in, had a like a 9.30 meeting with him. He's like, all right, you've got to do this today. It's happening. And then you're like, oh, shit, this is happening. You know, like, this is weird. But uh, I guess you've got to... He said, again, like, the chemo is very well tolerated, but you've got to have, you know, sometimes it can take up to 12 months if someone reacts doesn't react that well to it. It can take 12 months before everything to be normal again sort of thing with you. And so just in case and then it does you know it does make you infertile and that sort of stuff so you have to have plan b so to speak and so we've decided to to go that option anyway so but it's it's good knowing that you know there is that plan b and hopefully it doesn't come to that but uh so what is it like they give you a magazine and a jar and you go into a room like there was a drawer full of magazines and then a, a nice big tv and but then jess was like she was texting me while I was in there and she's like, how's it going? You know, like, it's not going, it's not working out at all. The first thing I thought about is like, you sit in this chair and I'm like, how many other guys have been in this chair? And I'm like, such a, such a gross thought. So, but one of those, you know, one of those moments that you just have to deal with and Jess is trying to send me encouragement, like do it for our future kids, you know, this sort of stuff. And it's like, oh shit, this is getting even weirder now. <laughs> it's very, I uh, will just, um, 
we'll take a quick break. I want to talk about, I, t- I, I touched on it briefly at the start, and it was, it was more about, I talked about your fans and your followers and your supporters and so forth, and and I saw there's, there's two elements to, uh, to this. There's the strength for Jared, you know, the, everything's a hashtag these days, but strength for Jared, but also the GoFundMe or page that came up. Were you expecting of any of that? Um, well, actually, there's a good friend of mine at home, Ryan Myler, who I've known since I was about 15 or 16. He came to me with that whole plan because, you know, he knows that these things aren't cheap. You know, the amount of bills we've had rolling in and a lot of it, we do have good health care and, and all that in Australia, but uh, at the same time, there's a lot of stuff that's still out of, out of pocket expenses. And the next, uh, I guess, part, a big part of that as well is, is uh, the uncertainty of, you know, because there's no doubt that I'm not going to be making as much money next year if I can't be racing full time. So um, we've kind of got to prepare for that as well. You know, at the end of the day, like bills keep coming in and they're going to keep coming in for quite a while. And this whole process isn't going to be a cheap one sort of thing. And, you know, other things pop up as well. So he just an old good friend and Blair Sullivan, the other guy sort of doing it with him, two local guys, both in the mountain bike club and just good guys wanted to help out and do something good for me so that's how all that sort of came about with the GoFundMe page and and like I said like we just, we just, there's so many uncertainties at the moment you just don't know what next year's going to be like you know and at the end of the day you've still got to pay bills and put food on the table and the one thing I can't skimp on right now is just uh, your health and you've got to you know eat well and do the right things to make sure you get healthy and so we're just trying to put a plan in place for that with, and the, the donations and the support on that has just been amazing and I can't say thanks enough to everyone because it's just been even that just seeing in the comments they leave when they leave a donation as well just you know picks up your day and is it, is you, you it, kind of feel like you're not so not I've had awesome you know obviously family and friends close friends have been awesome support Jess has just been amazing my wife can't say enough good things about things she's done for me the last month now so um but just knowing you've got that support, it makes you feel like you're sort of doing this for other people as well and you want to do right by them and, and all that sort of stuff. And definitely not trying to make money out of it, like that would just be wrong. So, But anything we don't need, we're going to donate back to cancer research. So there's always a, if, if someone thinks, you know, like, I'm not going to donate because he doesn't need the money, but while well, that might be true, but, you know, we just don't know at the moment, just don't know how expensive things are going to get and... uh Anything we don't need is going to be donated back to a good cause, so that's a good reason to get in there and help out if, if you feel that's what you want to do. So, Is there a sense of humility, meaning that, I don't know, if, if I started one of these things, I'd be surprised if anyone gave me like $10 sort of thing. <laughs> like, like was, was, did it, did oh, that side of it surprise you? Just, just like some, you know, you know, people you've never even met before, you know, like, and giving some pretty sizable donations, some of them too, like just makes you really like restores your your faith in humanity you know like just knowing there's there is really good people out there who genuinely care and and sympathize with the situation you're going through and it, it is shitty i'm not gonna lie it's not something i sort of expected to hear or that i was going to be having to deal with when you're at the age i'm at and whatever and, and whatever but uh just like knowing that people care and are willing to I guess it's something I've always done too. I've always tried to, you know, when Sam hurt himself, Sam Willoughby, I, I uh, auctioned one of my one of my old race helmets and got a bit of money for him and and that sort of stuff. So it's, I guess, maybe that's a bit of karma coming around. Who knows? But uh, it's definitely been very appreciated. It makes you feel good, you know, like it just uh, makes you realise there's, there's, like I said, good people out there and and it do, it does feel good to help people out, like. Going back to like what we were talking about with training with Richie and Sam and that sort of stuff, like it, it that what I get out of it makes me feel good and makes me feel satisfied and seeing them, you know, all the, all the successes they've had and all that sort of stuff and and you know definitely like you get a situation like this if if, if someone sort of somewhat close to you or whatever it kind of hits home and and that sort of stuff and and um. I just hope, you know, in the future, I'm, I know I'll definitely be more willing to, not that I'm not unwilling, but it's like, it's pretty easy to get caught up in your own, own affairs sometimes and whatever and, and get a bit selfish about some things, but just uh, having that support and 
and um, just makes me want to, you know, make sure I help out other people in the future and just try to be a good person, you know, and it feels good to help, so. Does it make you think about your place as a professional cyclist a little bit differently? You know, it, it, and I ask this because I think of the scenario there might be, let's say, little Kate living in Central America might have donated $10 to you, but you've yep. never met little Kate. You yep. don't know anything about little Kate. Yep. But you, what you've done potentially and what you still do has an impact on people's lives. Like when, you, when you're racing a bike, obviously you don't have time to think about these sorts of things all the time. But now there's been a pause and there's been, I guess, an outpouring. Does it make you think about your role a little bit differently? Uh, I'd yeah, be lying if I said no. Like, like I said before, it just makes you want to do right by people and, and, and try to give the support back. And like life's not all about riding and racing bikes, but it is something that, you know, obviously it shows that people... You, know, you have had an impact on them and, and that makes you feel pretty good about things and I guess one thing I've always tried to do at races especially is take time to talk if someone wants to come and talk to you and you know get a photo or whatever or an autograph or something like take the time to ask them how their day's been and just try to be you know a nice friendly person and I think that's kind of like maybe rubbed off on you know some people and and uh but just taking that time to like you know just show an interest in you know, cause at the end of the day, we're, we're all just people who like riding bikes down in the bush. So um, it's not too hard to just, you know, have a bit of a chat to someone, ask them how their day's been and shows that, you know, it has an effect on them. And I think it's been noticed and I've definitely had enough people send me messages and, and them share their story with when I met them and took the time to have a bit of a talk to them and just try to be a, you know, friendly, a friendly face that, you know, don't be that person there sitting in the pits who just disappears as soon as practice is done and so I definitely in the four cross days I definitely didn't spend too much time in the pits and that sort of stuff because I was always all about getting off my feet as much as I could much to Damien Smith's not huge amounts of of uh of uh affection towards how much time I would always insist on not being in the pits and that sort of stuff so but I think it's with enduro that's it's like kind of been a big part of it is like just being there and being a friendly face, being someone people can approach and talk to and, and actually try to engage in conversation with them and and give them information if they ask a question and and just, you know, like I said, just be like a, a friendly face and just, uh, I guess it all just comes down to just trying to be a, a good person that people can relate to and, and do the right thing by people. The other side um, is the you know, strength for Jared. Um, I was quite amused over the weekends to see lots of horrible haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> floating around like absolutely horrible air cuts. I think even Cody Kelly got his... Cody did something finally he, after... He cut his hair. I was talking to him quite a lot over the weekend and by the sounds of things, he was copping quite a bit of flack from some people for just ignoring, you know, all the comments. And But eventually he gave in, I think, and got a uh, little video from, from him the other day of his hair falling on the ground, which absolutely cracked me up. So actually that was just yesterday, I think. And uh, so he's... He's taken the dive. Even his dad took the dive. And just seeing his dad's got a mean mohawk at the moment. Even a couple of nephews at the moment. They both went and got their, got their jerry hawks cut in. So they look pretty snazzy at the moment too. What, what, and what does that sort of thing do for you? That actually, that, that's been like something awesome the last week. Just seeing that support that the people would go and, like we said, cut in like an absolutely terrible haircut basically. And just to show the support like... At least I've got a reason for having mine at the moment. So, but they they absolutely didn't have to do that, and just the support for them showing that they they did it. Just like random people too, like you could just get on Instagram and just search hashtag Jerry Hawk, and you just see like you know kids like there's just some super young kids that have done it, and just random people that I've never met, and it's pretty cool. So, and what if you if you could see those people, I guess you you will be catching up with. You know, the racing fraternity sometime in the future but if you yep. could see all those other people what would you say to them i don't know really like just um have a chat to them just whatever they want to talk about and just again like we we're talking about just before like if they just want to ask about how you're doing and and just uh just you know i don't know really just um just be a friendly person and 
and just, just say thanks and just that you appreciate the support because every time I see someone with, with a haircut and when I see the photo it just it just brings a smile to my face every single time so it's been pretty cool All right, those things I guess are a kind of little things or for some people big things but they at the end can... of the day too I guess it's just hair and it does grow back so and it helps be uplifting for yourself exactly no, it's been it's been awesome so and talking about your support they say for every leader or champion or whatever it might be there's somebody in the background <laughs> <laughs> and who's that somebody in your background oh definitely like you know my family's been awesome this this last sort of you know six weeks whatever it's been since the seizures came on and that sort of stuff and since we got an, an initial initial diagnosis and that sort of stuff but jess has just been absolutely just you know basically i can't drive a car with the meds i'm on so she has to drive me everywhere and and uh so she's just been absolutely amazing and and like you you, you need someone in the situation i'm in like you need someone to like help you out with things and there's a lot of things i can't do for myself right now and can't say enough good things about the people that take their time and you know like you can get pretty uh couple of days when I was talking about earlier I had a couple of like meltdowns and they're just there to like comfort you and support you and that sort of stuff and be there for you so it's it's pretty special yeah I mean I mean and as I was saying before is that um before we started this interview these things always seem to happen to other people yep we always see it happen to other people we don't it rarely happens to people we know and um and obviously when those things happen, it makes, you know, it changes our opinions on things, changes our opinions on, you know, just, you know, what's going on with people's lives. Maybe we need more time to, to stop and think and yeah, be totally. grateful and all these sorts of things. But in any sort of weird ways, do you see a purpose in it? Um, I mean, who knows? Like, it's, I guess it's one of those things that, like, you know, even talking to the, the surgical team and that and the doctors now, like, there is no known reason for why brain tumours, like, what, what causes them or anything. It's just, but uh, as far as purpose, like, who would know? Like, that's, you know, that's, that, that'd be up there with, like, what's the meaning of life sort of thing. Like, you know, I guess these things happen for a reason, but it's not really understood what, what these reasons are. So I think, like, with everything in life, any any sort of situation dealt you just need to take you know learn whatever you can from it and try to take the positives and and hopefully you just have it rub off and and uh hopefully you can positively affect the rest of your life then because i'm not going anywhere anytime soon so i've got plenty of years left don't worry about that and this this might be a bit touchy i'm not sure but what is the prognosis what is um the- well given there's a lot of different types of of brain tumors and i I have one of the more common ones or had one of the more common ones which is actually pretty good and and just with like technology and medicine and treatments and all that these days the the outlook is 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 pretty positive at the moment so there's a couple brain tumors where i can't remember the names they're they've all got these funky big scientific sounding names and but there's there's one that it was just like please don't be that one you know there's one that's only got something like a 20% 20% five year survival rate because basically it's just super aggressive and just keeps growing and growing and but just the fact that uh, it was low grade and slow growing and, and all that sort of stuff and treatment now like we can really get rid of everything on the microscopic level so they never give you like a, a guarantee that it will never grow back but the prognosis is, is pretty positive at the moment so that's been something that's been the big relief because that's like your biggest fear you know like what if this does kill me you know like because it, it definitely can but i think the modern like the one sort of scary thing was the guy that the guy in brisbane that did my was doing my scans basically he said where the tumor is and the, and and how they like even the surgery techniques from 15 20 years ago he's like if this was 20 years ago you'd be stuffed you'd be like left left side paralytic for the rest of your life with like where they had to take the tumor from sort of thing so that kind of makes things hit home a little bit, so kind of there's definitely a scary side to it. But uh, we're just lucky to live in the sort of the, the modern era, and you know, technology is is pretty incredible, and 
and can't say enough good thing, things about the doctors down there at the Wesley where we've had all my treatments so far, so they've been absolutely unreal. And <clears throat> just, uh, you know, I think a big part is just like, like I said earlier, like learning about diets and stuff and just ways to look after your body that can, that can really stop, you know, any future problems or at least minimize it as much as you can. So I know it's something that'll be like, you know, just the way I look at diets and stuff like that will probably be some things that I'm going to make sure I do for the rest of my life, you know, just to minimize the chance of it ever having a chance to, to grow back. So, but I mean, just that thought knowing that this, it came out of nowhere and, and I wasn't expecting it like we, like we talked about and it's something you, there's no way I'm not going to think about it daily for the rest of my life. So that just makes you want to really um, kind of just make the most of every day, I guess, and like like live like you should live anyway. So just be a good person and and just uh, make the most of everything and don't take anything for granted. So like it's uh, just something uh, to me. That's the main positive I'm going to take out of it anyway, and that sort of stuff. Did that. Jess. Oh. <laughs> we won't be too much longer, Jess. Oh, that's okay. Michael. You can, you can, do you want to, okay. you can join in for a moment if you want. No, no, that's okay. You sure? <laughs> Is he just up at the front door? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, we'll be, yep. We won't be too lo much longer, no. Um, here we are getting to the bottom of the list of my little scribbles here in front of me. Um, I think we've, we have touched on this a little bit, but it's just, um, uh, without talking about the the other stuff we've talked about, that might have to get edited out. But um, <laughs> so where where is where is the journey going now? Like what is obviously we've got the medical journey, but you you definitely still want to get back on a bike. You definitely still want to race. Oh God, I don't I don't think I can't imagine my life without bikes in it. So I know it's, it's something I've always said. It's something I'll do to the to the day I die. You know, like until I'm physically unable to actually ride a bike that's the only thing that will keep me off the bike and I've always been into like sort of you know health and fitness in general and that sort of stuff and I think mountain biking and cycling in general is one of the you know anytime you can incorporate something that's fun and enjoyable and a social thing that keeps you sort of fit and healthy is like you know it certainly beats the hell out of going to the gym and that sort of stuff if people want to stay fit and whatever and try and prolong their you know their health and their lives and that sort of stuff so where biking's always going to be a part of my life and, and all that sort of stuff. So, and just did, just on that, what does mountain biking do for you? Um, to me, like the thing I'm sort of looking forward to, I guess, in the future is just. I mean, I've always been a very sort of you know, results and just results driven person, and just seeing like we talked about earlier that improvement and just pushing yourself and seeing what you can make yourself do, and and I think that teaches you different things for life in general that, that you can always apply to things and help you out and, and whatever so um just sort of lost my train of thought there for a second no, that's fine it's just basically you know is your know, mountain biking's good for your physical being it's good for your I just mental think it's, it's, being. It's, a, it's definitely like mountain biking in general i love uh, it doesn't i sort of don't get the chance to do it very often but uh when we can just go out for you know, ride with friends at home and you know, it's more of an off-season thing where you might just meet up with some people and just go for a social ride and just, like we talked about earlier, just some of the, the crap you start talking about, it's just just a good, fun, social sort of thing to do and pushing each other and you know, having a bit of a race up a climb or race down a hill, like something that everyone always enjoys doing a bit of that. So, But just the social side of things is, I mean, I guess that's what drew me to it in the first place when I was a teenager, just going out with your buddies and riding and Injury was basically what we always used to do, you know, we'd like cruise up the hills and race each other down and after school every day, that's how I got into riding, so um, just sort of doing more of that in the future is, you know, something I'm really looking forward to as well and, and you do like, I've got some, you know, like I said, the guys that have been behind the, the whole GoFundMe page, like Ryan is a guy I've known since I was a teenager and, you know, he's another guy that I know, you know, we've been friends now for you know, like, geez, that's 20 years ago that I met him and, you know, we're still friends to this day and, you know, just the friendships you build is, is pretty pretty special. Like, it's one of those sports that you sort of can build good relationships with people and that's pretty uh, that's pretty cool. Well, thank you. If, if, is, um, is there anything more you, we may have missed? I can't think of too much. I think we've covered everything and a little bit more even. Covered everything. Oh, I guess... 
um, for for my perspective. I want to say thank you for sharing. No, thank you. And thanks, thanks for anyone who's actually taken the time to listen yeah. to all this. <laughs> and, Sorry it went so long, Spoma. We've got a bit of, bit of work for you oh, to do now. Yeah, and um, yeah, yeah, Spoma wants to say thank you. Um, everyone that I've talked to sends their best wishes, as you've seen online and so forth. And just thank you for your time. Um, and uh, good luck with the future. Cheers. No, thanks, everyone, for the support. Again, it's just been absolutely incredible. So can't say thanks enough. Thanks for tuning in to Vital MTB's The Inside Line podcast. Episodes drop every other Wednesday. Thanks to Jensen USA and Maxis Tires for the support. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Vital MTB.